Japan Airlines has long been an emblem of Japanese culture. JAL is a country of the world. I think that the people, 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 the people. But less than a decade ago, Japan Airlines took a nosedive. They've got $25 billion worth of debt, so their debt is 100 times what their valuation is. It was so obvious that unless something dramatic changed, this whole company would go bankrupt, which would be a severe blow for the whole psychology of the country. This is the story of how a nation's flagship airline nearly went bust. Japan Airlines, it's likely to declare bankruptcy. And how it was saved by a Buddhist monk turned CEO. Japan Airlines was established in 1951, first flying domestic routes. In 1954, the airline launched its first international service, flying the Tokyo-Honolulu-San Francisco route, and began to build a special relationship with the Japanese people. With its emphasis on service, the airline has traditionally been a source of national pride. JALさんのいいところ、あの、ま、飛行機の中も綺麗ですし、すごいサービスもいいと思います。ま、いろいろ毛布とかも気づいたらあの、さっと出してくれたり、お水とかも頼んだらま、すぐもらえたり。じゃ
Japan Airlines could use those very low interest rates to borrow cheaply, keep costs down, and fares low to attract more customers. Philip Zerillo has used the company's story as a textbook example of what could go wrong in an airline. This is like Mexico was running a 60% in, uh, interest rate at the time. If we went to Brazil, somebody like Vera might have been facing at that time a 400% interest rate. Brazil and Mexico were some of the most popular destinations for Japanese tourists. Japan Airlines flew direct routes to these countries, and low interest rates back home meant they could offer their customers great deals. So to be able to keep up with the Japan Airlines and their investment in capital, places like uh, Brazil, the United States, any place in Latin America was not going to be able to compete. With access to a seemingly never-ending supply of cheap bank loans, Japan Airlines management continued their ambitious expansion plans, and now they looked beyond aviation for new investment opportunities. But when you have access to a lot of capital, and capital is very cheap, you tend to expand um, beyond your core businesses. And that's what they did at uh, Japan Airlines. The airline's board decided to invest heavily in foreign hotels, a very different business challenge from running an airline. And they got farther and farther away from the core of the company, which was to operate an airline. You know, again, if we take something like hotels, again, capital is a very big part of building a hotel and operating a hotel, but it was well beyond their core competency of what they were skilled at, at operating and what have you. In 1984, Japan Airlines acquired Marriott Essex House in Manhattan for an undisclosed sum before spending a further 100 million US dollars on extensive renovations. The board's decision to invest heavily in new businesses with a growing portfolio of international hotels, resorts, and tour companies came just as the Japanese economy began to wobble. This aggressive expansion into businesses beyond their area of expertise left Japan Airlines badly overexposed and unable to cope with yet another run of economic downturns in the 90s. As passenger numbers dwindled, many of the company's planes sat idly, their value depreciating daily. The decision to diversify their businesses began to look like a very bad one. The economy was uh, sinking. Uh, they realized that the economy uh, was actually busting. The boom that happened in the 1980s was not probably not going to be uh, seen again for a little bit. Uh, so the demand for air transportation and also some of the other services in the economy certainly were hit. Assistant Professor Terence Fan has traced the attempts by the company's board to save the airline from the looming crisis. If you look at the number of destinations it served, in places like Europe, for example, it used to serve like 12 destinations. It was cut to about seven. Uh, and then it used to have a lot of services in the uh, Middle East area. And also, most of that was also cut as well in the 90s. So we see a lot of rationalization. Uh, but it's not clear whether those rationalization was enough to actually keep it uh, going uh, because the, the comp a competitive landscape keeps changing. To add to their self-inflicted problems, Japan Airlines were about to be rocked by a series of external events, which would threaten their very survival. By 1987, Japan Airlines was one of the most prestigious carriers in Asia, boasting the largest fleet of Boeing 747s in the world. Buoyed by the years of successful expansion, the Japan Airlines board began to invest heavily in other businesses linked to the aviation industry. 
Now that seems like a logical and a simple expansion of what it is that they do. But they began to define that a little bit more broadly and say, look, we have the passenger, now we should get into hotels, now we should get into tours, now we should get into catering. And all of a sudden, you can see that this begins to expand beyond what they were probably skilled at or what they initially um, had as their DNA of the company. Besides diversifying into other types of businesses, they also started buying up major stakes in smaller airlines that only flew domestic routes. And these acquisitions brought their own set of challenges. One of the other things that they did is, is they tried to generate more revenue from the domestic routes. And they bought one of the uh, domestic uh, players. So they bought another airline, and as they brought that airline in, the airline was completely different. So the airline, uh, as it came in, is flying different types of planes. So instead of flying all Boeing aircrafts, they might fly McDonnell Douglas or Airbus. By buying another airline's fleet, the Japan Airlines board didn't realize they were buying a new set of problems, inevitably leading to further inefficiencies and escalating costs. Now, if all of a sudden you have multiple plane makers, that means you have to have multiple spare parts, you have to have multiple crews because crews are not all able to fly just any plane. So all of a sudden, your pilots have to be instrument rated on a different aircraft. You have to keep crews that are different for McDonnell Douglas planes than Boeing planes, et cetera, et cetera. So this all throws off costs and rising cost structures in your uh, labor model. The company's board had developed some bad habits when they were state-owned. Now forced to compete in the open market, they had neither the experience nor the instincts to survive. Hiroshi Sugi, a former Japan Airlines pilot with almost 40 years' experience with the airline, remembers when things began to go wrong. その Instead of changing course by cutting costs and focusing on their core business, Japan Airlines tried to borrow their way out of trouble. It didn't work. In 1992, Japan Airlines posted 100 million US dollars in financial losses. It was the first time the company was in the red since privatization. The big news story today here in the Asia Pac is Japan Airlines. It's likely to declare bankruptcy as early as next week, and there's a lot of trouble for the uh, national. In response, the company finally slashed its workforce and began selling off some of its assets, desperately trying to undo the lavish overspending of the 1980s. With the company already on its knees, a series of global disasters soon made life for Japan Airlines even more difficult. The outbreak of the respiratory disease SARS that raged across Asia decimated the numbers willing to fly. You gonna mug me? I'm not gonna mug you. It's that gorgeous one, eh? And I believe I can run a decent marathon. Thank you very much. Download Veli now. Hiroyuki Kobayashi spent 42 years as a pilot with Japan Airlines. He recalls the internal crisis brought about by the SARS outbreak. SARS, 
大きな影響がありましたですねそれからいろんなそのコストですねいわゆるその交通費交際費あるいはいろんなミーティングを減らすとか、まあ、そういったあるいは宣伝を減らすと。And the blows kept coming. The New York World Trade Center attack in 2001 and the subsequent war in Iraq two years later rocked the global aviation industry. And the Japan Airlines board, previously insulated from real world pressures by its government paymasters, simply lacked the practical experience required to deal with sudden turbulence. With global uncertainties looming, more people were choosing not to fly, and the aviation industry had to continue operating on steadily shrinking profit margins. So, if we think about what、uh, you know, people pay in terms of the dollar figure, and in terms of the, on average, what airlines could get in terms of profit, what we expect is out of a hundred dollars that we pay. Typically, airlines only get maybe two dollars or one dollars or five,、uh, certainly less than ten in many cases,、uh, that they can translate into profits. For Japan Airlines, their already tiny profit margins were wiped out when passenger numbers began to collapse. The company had to ask the government owned Development Bank of Japan for an emergency loan of approximately 800 million US dollars, a desperate move that shook the confidence of customers and its own workforce. Well, of course, I'm not sure what I'm saying, but I'm not sure what I'm saying. 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 Mired in debt, shaken by a series of global shocks, and with an indecisive board, Japan Airlines' ability to survive looked far from certain. The attack on Iraq has begun. By the mid 2000s, a string of global events had put Japan Airlines into appalling levels of debt, amounting to over 2.5 billion US dollars. Even at home, Japan Airlines now lost its dominance of the domestic market to rival all Nippon Airways. The only response from the board was to take on further loans of nearly 630 million US dollars. So, why were other rival airlines better able to survive these tumultuous times? If we compare Japan Airlines with Singapore Airlines, we actually see Singapore Airlines being more profitable for more years and so on. And I think that has to do with the fact that Singapore Airlines for many years had been operating in a fairly competitive environment. And I think that helps、uh, you know, keep management on the toes and in tune with the latest changes. Like Singapore Airlines, Japan Airlines had always tried to live up to its image as the flagship of the nation. So, the unique thing about JAL is that it's a Japanese company, so it's got that sort of Japanese culture. They call it omotenashi here, so it's kind of expecting what the customer wants before the customer actually asks for it. So, that's what makes them unique. Keishi Nukina is an aviation enthusiast who followed Japan Airlines over the years and learned to value the traditional standards of service offered. One thing that distinguishes JAL from most of the other airlines out there is on several of their aircraft, they use A business class product called the Apex suit, so it's really spacey and it's kind of private, so it's, it's considered to be one of the best seats out there. That's what makes their business class, at least on some routes, somewhat unique. A uniquely Japanese approach to service that we e m b r a c But it was just this kind of old fashioned, over the top service that was making Japan Airlines unable to compete with its more nimble rivals. The biggest issue was the inefficiency, which was kind of caused by the mindset of beer invincible, so they They were always b a c k u i d e d by the government, so they always thought the government would have their back and they would spend money left and right. The crisis sort of opened all of the problems. Everyone suddenly could see as revenues broke away, as, as high yield travelers, business travelers didn't travel so much anymore. And then suddenly you could see how big the losses really were, how inefficient the airline really was. Professor Jochen Wertz has analyzed why some service companies get things so badly wrong. There was a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of complacency, very slow decision making, and not really the guts and the energy to make deep seated changes to the airline. 
With the odds stacked against it, Japan Airlines came to a screeching halt in 2010. The company was collapsing under a terrifying 25 billion US dollars worth of debt. Japan Airlines had to file for bankruptcy protection. The company vowed to slash some 15,000 jobs and received yet another bailout from the state to the tune of 11 billion US dollars. But pouring good money after bad by itself was never going to do the trick. Now, a sharp drop in traveler volume, if Japan Airlines can't commensurately reduce their operating costs, they're going to face a tremendous uh, negative consequence on their earnings and their financial um, situation. And that's exactly what happened. Tough aviation rules prevented Japan Airlines from coming up with flexible solutions to reduce costs. Now, there were some things in the background that they couldn't really get out of. So one is, is in Japan, um, you weren't allowed to have your crews be multiple aircraft rated. So everybody was only rated for one type of plane. So the ability to convert to smaller planes or shift crews between planes, all of that stuff was off the table for them. And secondly, uh, they had bought all 747s. I mean, they went to big planes and they didn't really fit the planes to meet the routes. What the smaller airlines were doing or the, the startup airlines were doing at the time is starting out small and what they were doing is, is eating into the seat volume on each and every one of these routes. By flying smaller planes, these airlines had lower overheads, operating with smaller crews and less fuel. The smaller airlines were able to fly at full capacity, while Japan Airlines was flying with far too many empty seats. You know, when that happens, you'll be chalking up a lot of losses. Certainly, uh, Japan Airlines was not alone in that, but the point was that starting uh, just go before going into this crisis, it was already heavily in debt. It was not in a position to really make drastic moves. So it just could not really survive. Faced with this existential threat, the former owners of Japan Airlines, the Japanese government, finally decided to intervene. After the financial crisis, when suddenly the losses became so big that it was so obvious that unless something dramatic changed, this whole company would go bankrupt, which would be a severe blow for the whole psychology of the country. It was the flag, or it is the flag carrier. It's Japan Airlines. I mean, how can you let a company of a proud country go bankrupt just like that? With national pride at stake, the Japanese government set up a committee of external experts to save Japan Airlines. Attorney at law Hideo Sato was put in charge of leading the turnaround. あの、国業ってね、やっぱり国の行政、あの、権益と非常にこう密接な関係がある。この会社がやってきたことも若干のあの変化を持たせるとしても、それを踏襲しながら、え、調整をするというぐらいのことしかおそらく発想として出てこない
ずっと聞いてましてこの人が JAL の社長になったらいいなと思ったんですからこれはいいと思いましたですねあの稲森さんに来ていただいて。So Mr. Inomori was chosen to lead the new Japan Airlines. I think he's a great person to do so. Inomori came from was a company called Kyocera,、uh, who's into、uh, ceramics and electronics.、Uh, what really makes this company stand out is that in the past、uh, so many decades, it had always been able to make a profit every year. So that's、uh, put Japan Airlines in stark contrast. So I think it's a great person. To bring in to Japan Airlines to really rethink what it really ought to do. Kazuo Inomori quickly put in place his plans to reverse Japan Airlines' ailing fortunes. So the first thing he had to do was go to the land and ministry of、uh, transportation and get loans and get bailout loans for cash and operating. He had to also go to the financial community and ask for some forgiveness of debt. With the idea, with the promise that、um, they would go forward. But borrowing more cash was never going to be enough to turn things around. The new CEO next focused on the iconic status of the nation's airline and the damage that would be done to Japan's international reputation if Japan Airlines was allowed to go to the wall. As he began to talk about how if JAL was allowed to fail, This would impact the citizenry of Japan. They would face、uh, limited options in their travel. They would eventually face higher prices. This was a matter of national pride. This was a matter of national security of airplane travel. This sort of message to the regulators, to the financial community, eased. Their trepidation, they, they could buy into this message. Inomori's quick actions may have stabilized Japan Airlines, but for the company to grow again, he would have to radically change the culture. The future of Japan Airlines rested in the hands of one man, Dr. Kazuo Inomori, a trained Buddhist monk with no previous experience in the aviation industry. Inomori was not a conventional choice as CEO. But amongst the Japanese business community, he developed a unique reputation for challenging common business practices and valuing people over profits, a philosophy he demonstrated by taking no salary for the first three years at Japan Airlines. And he came in with a new vision and with hope and with common sense. And his first sort of focus was on. Let's build up the team and the team spirit and the culture again. Let's make our team be proud to be Japan Airlines again. Inomori first had to convince the government that Japan Airlines simply could not be allowed to fail. A bankrupt national airline would be a stain on the nation's self respect and international reputation. He persuaded the government to write off some of the debts. Next, Inomori turned his attention to some fundamental problems at the heart of Japan Airlines. First, the government has to be able to do the same thing. This is why Inomori has to be able to do the same thing. The government has to be able to do the same thing. The government has to be able to do the same thing. The government has to be able to 経営哲学をしっかりした経営哲学を持っているでその人のが自分の言葉で現場を動かす力を持っているそれから強い強い信念を持っている、うん、極めて数字に細かい方日本国みたいにどんぶり感情だってたところが一気に変わったのはまさにそこのところが大きかったんですけどね。まああの、うん、で能力それから、うん、闘争心といいますかね、えー、社員の,あの幹部社員の方々に対しては大変失礼なことを申し上げたと思いますがしかしことごと作用にこれだけの何万人と6万人も7人万人もおる社員をその生活を守っていかなきゃならないという経営者がですねそういう採算というのがわからないのではどうにもなりませんとそういう意味で。大変失礼だったかもしれませんが、もし企業軍が排出していければ
During his time running Kyocera, Inamori had developed a management style which flew in the face of Japanese tradition. Instead of every decision being taken at the top and handed down, now the workforce was divided into small units, each with a leader given an unusual degree of freedom. And every worker was made to feel that they had something to contribute to the company's success. Inamori called it the amoeba philosophy. So the amoeba philosophy, as I understand from Mr. Inamori from his days in Kyocera, uh, is that it tasks each, each employee group, so each individual employee, uh, with you know, thinking about how his or her, 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 her actions actually relate to the company's bottom line. When compared with more traditional Japanese companies, this level of trust in the rank and file was genuinely revolutionary. For years, people had taken for granted lifelong employment and a little bit uh, of the fact that they are just serving their bosses. And there's a lot of uh, inertia. At the end, very end of the day, if the company is not making profit, the employees can't be too happy. I think that's sort of the, one of the bottom line that he was able to instill uh, into his employees. Every yen or cent counts. It's not just penny pinching, it's a way of thinking. Employees, from pilots to maintenance workers to customer service reps, are encouraged to attend a philosophy course. Small steps leading to one of the biggest corporate turnarounds in Japanese history. But Inamori could also make tough decisions. Faced with a bloated workforce, the former Buddhist monk was quick to wield the axe. At the time, they were running about 50,000 employees and 16,000 employees were gonna be cut. So you're talking about cutting something north of 30% of your labor force. Again, 30% of the labor force and that labor force that remained was gonna be asked to take a 30% pay cut and they were going to have their pensions reconfigured or, or revalued. Wow, these are tough things to get people to do. But again, he took that message of pride, integrity, national um, service. Um, this is something that is, is an imperative for Japan. And he took that message to that group as well. With a leaner workforce, Inamori was able to better focus on the day-to-day -day operations. This is the the Inamori-san が全ての数字を見ながら各部門の数字を見ながら細かくチェックをして数字のちょっとしても大きい毎月に毎月の数字のちょっとしても大きいについてこれは何だってそれで進めできないとその部門の担当者として不確かないんじゃ
交通費とかですね一般的なあのコストカットこれはもうかなり厳しくしましたけど安全面ではですねあの特に燃料を減らせとかですね。In 2012, just two years after narrowly escaping complete financial collapse, Japan Airlines was once again recognized as the world's most profitable airline for that fiscal year. そうなんだよ。それがすごいね。それはすごい。でその時の利益がね営業利益でね。600億を見込んでたんですよ600億でそれ絶対無理だとこんなね絵面ごと書きやがってと言われてたんだけれどもうん1年間頑張って先ほど申し上げたような、えー、コスト構造を全部こう見直しながらやっていったら With the company's finances settled and its workforce reorganized, Japan Airlines has been able to invest in new aircraft and offer its customers more routes It actually had made some investment decisions earlier in terms of acquiring new, modern, and more fuel efficient jets called the 787 series. That in itself helped it become more efficient in some of the existing operations,、uh, as well as to open new markets. For example, it started new service to places like Boston、uh, and San Diego from Tokyo, so further strengthening its、uh, you know, presence in the, in the important. North American market.、Uh, at the same time, it was able to use some of these new, modern, fuel efficient jets to open and strengthen some of its old routes, such as Moscow and Helsinki and in Europe, for example. Customer service remains the airline's top priority. So it's good in, in, in offering very professional, business,、uh, you know,、uh, business friendly sort of service. To、uh, customers who really are able to pay for the kind of premium services that it offers, it has certainly strengthened its connections and presence in North America and also to some cities, key cities in, in, in Asia, in East Asia. The final proof that Inomori had turned things around came when Japan Airlines launched its initial public offering in 2012. At 8.5 billion US dollars, the second largest IPO worldwide after Facebook. Hmm. Yeah, so it's now in the state of 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 うん忘れないで緊張感を持って取り組んでいればまあ新しい課題が出てきても乗り切れるだろうなとは思ってます。Inomori stepped down as chairman of Japan Airlines in 2013, and in 2015 he became an advisor to the new management. You know, Japan Airlines probably today has、um, the challenge will be. To remember their failures, right, and to think about their future. They've trimmed down a lot of the、um, non profitable businesses, the cash flows are better, but you don't want to go back to the things that you once did. So learn from your mistakes, don't repeat your mistakes. And I think that will be the challenge for the company. And it won't be clear skies anytime soon as a legacy airline company like Japan Airlines faces a different set of challenges with LCCs or low cost carriers. By offering a no frills, cheaper alternative, these LCCs cater to a whole new segment of travelers with modest budgets. もう海外からその伝統的な航空会社だけではなくて LCC がどんどんどんどんと入ってくるでしょうねでそれを利用する人たちの数がどんどん増えてるじゃないですかインバウンドがあの日本に来てくれる海外旅行客が増えたそのかなりのものはやっぱりその LCC を利用してる方たちでしょう日本に安い気あるけども世界の人たちが日本航空を使ってくれる。だからインバウンドの人たちも日本が日本人が外に出かけるときも利用できるとこうしなきゃいけないだから日本人が外に行くとき使うけれども帰りはその人たちがさらになってくると
空席で送ってくれるじゃダメでむしろ海外の人たちがそこに乗って日本に訪れてくれるようなまあこれは飛行航空会社だけではなくて日本の観光政策全体に関わるような問題なんでしょうけどねうん、まあ、そういう中で、えー、これからの大変な時期にうんどうなんだろうね,あのね LCC 基本的にはね短い距離をね大変とってねポンポン飛ぶから。They are definitely going to continue the, serving the premium routes with JAL but they're also trying to start out a new low cost airline for their medium and long haul flights that will be started in 2020 around the Olympics or before the Olympics. The 2020 Summer Olympics in Tokyo will give Japan Airlines an added opportunity to boost revenues as a global audience flies in to support their athletes. JAL is Tokyo 2020 Olympic and Paralympic official airline partner. But the airline will need to ensure that the hard learned lessons of the past are not forgotten. I don't think it will try to grow as big as possible, but I certainly think it can grow consistently and profitably、uh, going forward using exactly the same philosophies that has guided、uh, Japan Airlines in the past few years. Japan has a very strong image in terms of hospitality, in terms of their、uh, precision and, and their. their A strong adherence to traditions and to protocol and to, yeah, and to reliability and to quality. And I think all of that is, 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 is brought back into the Japan Airlines brand. And that is unique to them. In 2018, Japan Airlines reported an expected operating profit of 1.5 billion US dollars. New routes are being offered to the Middle East, Africa, and Central Asia. But the challenge remains to maintain the traditions that made Japan Airlines its nation's flagship carrier without ever again losing sight of the bottom line.